Acts chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 1 and go to verse 10. And it says this, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. That is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. What are alms? Monies, goods. And it says, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And our last verse in it says, and recognized him. And it says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for arms. And the Bible says, and through this, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. I want to come from the message title, if you could write this down, the miracle of an encounter. The miracle of an encounter. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would have an encounter with you on today. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen. Thank you so much, musicians. Can you help me give it up for our dream team that's in the building? To, come on, help me celebrate our dream team. So grateful for them. I want to preach on this message and in this series, The God of Miracles, because what I think at times is that we do not recognize or understand the greatness of the power that lies within us. It is a power that God gave his son Jesus and Jesus promised to those of us that were a part of the way, meaning having salvation unto the cross. It, he lets us know that he, being Jesus, would ascend, but when he ascended, he would send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was to be a comforter to those that were a part of walking with Jesus. Now, this is an important thing to understand that we need the Holy Spirit because what Jesus is asking of us to do, we can only do through the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a life that God has called you to. There is a purpose and plan that the Lord has spoken over your life. There is an understanding to the ways of God and the things of God and the purpose that God has settled in your life today. And I need you to understand it. I need you to know that what God has set inside of you is something that cannot be accomplished by your will. It is something that cannot be accomplished by your degree. It is something that cannot be accomplished by your good nature. It is something uh, that must happen out of the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to let you know there's something on the inside of you uh, that is greater than what you understand and can imagine. But if you know like today, one of the things that we find ourselves encountering and one of the things that we find ourselves a part of is that we are in a society today, I don't know if you know that, that well, but we're a part of a world that's always looking for a remedy. 
We're always looking for a remedy for peace. We're, we're looking for a remedy for joy. We're looking for a remedy to escape anxiety, to escape depression. We're looking for a remedy to put us in a place where we can feel like we are winning at life. And the remedies oftentimes can cost us our peace. The remedies can oftentimes cost us our purpose. The remedies can get us caught up because all Oftentimes, we don't know how to do life without a remedy. We're trying to do life with things that will help us in a special way get to where we need to go. Where we're, we're taking a, 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 a medicine that helps us be able to deal with areas of our life. And, and we need medicine. I, I have medicine that I'm a part of. But the issue is, is that we're looking for a remedy to life. And we're trying to solve it with temporary things that can only uphold uh, our physical bodies. Uh, but there's a remedy to our our soul that we need. There's a peace that we need. There's a, a joy that we're called to have. There, there's a ladder of a, a being in a place where God is creating a new in us and we're supposed to be vibrant. But here's the thing that we find out is that we position ourselves in life that we know that we have Jesus, but we're not experiencing the best life possible. The Bible lets us know in John chapter 10, verse 2, it says in the latter part of it that Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have that life more abundantly, but my question question is, are you in Christ, but yet you're living the worst life ever? There's no reason for us to know God and not excel at being a follower of Jesus. We're oftentimes trying to find a remedy. We get home. And we try to find a remedy. I just need to take the edge off. A little remedy. You know Jesus turned water into wine, Pastor. I just need something to help me get through the day. I need a remedy because here's the thing is that I have not learned how God's peace can be the remedy of what I need. I have not learned that if I really could trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding and, and in every way acknowledge him that he would direct my path. I, 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 it's just something that, to know that the joy of the Lord can be my strength even at times uh, when I find myself in the predicament when life is not going the best, I just want to tell somebody today is that a relationship with God helps me to live the life that I know will always be perfect without finding a remedy that gets me addicted to my psychopathic ways of trying to control the way life is going and trying to escape the moments of life that I need to be able to endure to process that the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me in the good and the Lord is with me in the bad. The Bible says uh, in John 16 33, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. You can't have relationship with Jesus Christ and escape the realities uh, that you will go through. That's why uh, you don't need a remedy, you need a savior. A remedy will only meet a short-term goal. It will only bring relief for a short time. You know if you've got Motrin in your house, a set of metaphene, Tylenol, aspirin, you know that it has an expiration date. And it says this only works for a certain amount of time. It says after six or eight hours, you can take another one. Some of us daily overdose because we understand about hour four, when the pain begins to start kicking in, we become our own prescribed doctors. I know it says four, but I could probably do it with five. Because oftentimes, the pressure of life forces me to find a remedy to bring about a peace 
that I don't know how to solve unless I've got something to take away the pain. But the issue of it is, is that Jesus knew that there would be painful moments and we would need a comforter for the pain so that in the pain, as we experience it, we would not walk away from the faith knowing that pain was going to happen in this life regardless of if we're with God or we're not with God. It was coming either way. And so he said, I want to send you a comforter. And as we see this moment in scripture, we find that we are responding in this moment in the story to a man who has found himself in a predicament and he is trying to find a remedy to cope with where he is, to find a remedy to cope with where he can't do, to find a remedy to cope with what he cannot get of himself. And so he is begging daily for alms, something to support him to be a remedy to where he is currently in life. If we jump back a chapter in Acts chapter 2, we find out that the very promise that Jesus gave in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I will sing you the Holy Spirit. And he says, and this Holy Spirit shall give you power. The issue is is that if I've never had a life of power, I am always in a thought process of how I'm going to fix the problems in my life with the resources that I have. And if most of us would think about it, our resources are limited, that's why our power is limited. So we begin to accept whatever the case is Instead of recognizing that we have an all-powerful God who can do impossible things in our life, but we have not established an understanding, so we begin to remedy our life that life will always look this way. I will always live in this anxiety. I will always live out of this depression. I will always live in this space of life where I have to deal with it. But I want to let you know that God came to let us know that there is something miraculous about being connected with the source of power that can change any and everything in your life uh, if you just understood uh, that you weren't trying to find a remedy, you were trying to find a solution. It is not a remedy that can get you to the next season of your life. It is not a remedy that can take you into the next place of where you're going. Uh, your remedy only has to do what? Keep going up and up. Uh, the more pain I receive, it means what? The more drugs I need. But if I understood uh, that there was a God that could supply all of my needs uh, according to his riches and glory, I would settle myself uh, and understand I don't need anything else uh, outside of whatever God has given me. I don't want to be prescribed something uh, that I put myself on uh, to numb the pain. Can I tell somebody today the reason why you can't stand uh, is because you've been numbing the pain for too long uh, and you need to be able to go through a trial uh, for because trials produce perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces some hope. But because we are sold on remedies, because remedies produce quick results, we get stuck. Think of how many ads come up on your feed, on your TV, to provide a remedy for a place where you could be healed. Some of us are taking all kinds of things. You got teaspoons of apple cider vinegar <laughs> that you're just sipping away at. Some of you said, the more I can handle, the more it'll heal. You got so much sea moss in your cabinets. You stocked up on sea moss like you a dealer. Because the idea behind it is that if I can find the right remedy, 
it'll take away the pain. But the truth of the matter is, if pain is not healed, it will always come back. Which means you will always have to produce a remedy. But the problem with the remedy is, is that if it doesn't heal it, most likely the pain grows out the remedy. Which need, means you need more in order to survive more pain. Which means the remedy has to keep growing and growing. You remember you only did a little bit. It was just a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar. Now you're drinking cups and Stanley Cup fulls <laughs> to figure out how you stay healthy. You just smoked a little bit of it. Whoa, whoa, Pastor. Whoa, I got a card. I got a card, Pastor. I got a card. I'm just saying. I got a card. I got a card. I can show you my card. But it was just to take the pain away. And I only needed it once a day. But for some reason, the remedy went from being a possible solution to a full-on addiction. And I became dependent on things instead of being dependent on God. Here's why I say this is because many of us have found ourselves that we don't even pray anymore because we know how it's going to end. I know how the anxiety puts me. I know where it puts me. I know, I know where I get to. I, I know where the depression leaves me. I know what I do after I have the depression and I know where I go. I know where the pain leaves me and after the pain does this, I know. So I don't even pray anymore because I've been so used to handling it my way. It's amazing because when we don't understand that, we become so adjusted to dealing with the pain that we're never believing God for the solution. In Acts chapter three, there is a man who is lame, but the Bible says he's been lame since birth. And being lame since birth means he's become adjusted to his condition. My question today is, have you become adjusted to your condition? And have you found yourself in a state where the adjustment of your condition has put you into a place where you've learned to deal with it and stop praying for it? The Bible says that daily they, daily they, daily they, daily they, that's a, that's a tricky part. Daily they came and put him uh, uh, in front of the gate. Here's what I want to let you know. This story is a little bit odd because there's some points that we've got to gather that don't make a lot of sense to me or at least I don't understand. And the problem with the story that it is a little jacked up, if I can tell you as I was reading the Bible, is I thought about this. If this is the East Gate, that leads to the temple and the temple is where all went to that must have mean that if he came daily it means Jesus passed by and he missed Jesus how many times have you found yourself settling for your condition while sitting in church How many times have you felt yourself settling for the state you're in while still yet having devotions and prayer time? The question that I have for you is how did Jesus pass by you? The question is how did you miss the Savior 
who the Bible lets us know was healing on Solomon's portrait. Listen, on the colonnade, he said the Bible says he was healing and Jesus was there. And it lets us know this man is right at the point of where Jesus was doing healings. My problem with this is, is how many times have you been in the presence of the Lord and yet you haven't asked God for your healing, your deliverance. You've just sat there and said, God, I'll take the pain because my expectation level is that it's going to stay the same way that it is how many times have you been in the presence of a living God who is able to do uh, exceeding and abundantly above all that you can ask or think and settled yourself for arms and settled yourself for a worship moment and settled yourself for a praise and settled yourself for a good time at church but didn't rise up out of your seat and say God I need you uh, to do something today uh, in my life like never before How many times have you been in the presence of the Lord and yet settled for the state of where you are? The Bible says he came every day, every day, and begged for alms, which has me to believe he had an encounter with Jesus. Pastor, can you prove it? Sure. Luke chapter 22, verse 53. The Bible says every day, I was with you. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. Every day, I was with you what? In the temple courts. He says, and you did not lay a hand on me. He was talking to the Pharisees, which means every day, Jesus was in the temple. Every Sunday, you came and the Spirit of the Lord moved. Every day, you came and bowed before God and had devotion time. Every day, you talked about the presence of the Lord, but never experienced the presence of the Lord. Every day. <laughs> Jesus said, I don't know how you didn't experience me when I was there every day. said I was I was there every day and then to add injury to insult Matthew 21 and 14 says and now the blind and the cripple came to him and he healed them there what <sighs> the blind and the cripple came to him and he healed them there in the temple. You can be in the same place where the presence of the Lord is and never come to him. You can be in the vicinity but not in the presence. He said, I was, I was healing people. You know, we, I got a lot of questions sometimes. The Bible says Peter and John came to him, and it's, it's, it's a very uh, cinematic moment that happens. This man looks to them and says, do you have something? And it says, and then Peter and John's eyes, it just focused on them. You can see it in the movie. You can see it happen. It's the close-up on the camera, and they look to him. <laughs> and then the shot is he looks to them. It's cinematic. It's funny that at times we've been in the state we've been in for so long that we stop knowing what to ask for and we quit where we are to stay and do what we've normally done. Jesus had been there before and had he come to Jesus, there's a possibility this story never would have happened. But I'm so glad that the Lord doesn't reward me according to my iniquities. I, 
I told Overseer, I said, there's a song that's been ringing in my heart. It says, please be patient with me. God's not through with me yet. Somebody tell your neighbor, God's not through with me. You might want to throw me away, but I want to let you know God's not through with me yet. Tell your other neighbors, just say, be patient. You, you, you got, see, see, see we, we got too many people that are ready to cancel you too quickly. We got too many people that saw your situation and, and they saw you opt out and they're like, you know what? No, you're not even in the club no more. No, no, no. Just be patient with me. God's not through with me yet. See, here's the thing. I might have been stuck in one season of my life, but I'm not going to stay stuck where I am. Tell somebody beside you, I won't stay stuck. I believe I can't stay stuck because I believe uh, that God still has a work on me. Yep, I was messing up and acting like I didn't have my mind set together. Yep, uh, I was in church acting a fool, uh, but he got a hold of me. Uh, and something about when he got a hold of me opened my mind for me to be able to see uh, God's not through with me yet. Uh, I just want to tell somebody today, you might have gave up on me, but God didn't give up on me. If he didn't give up on you, how about you give him a praise right here. Woo! He didn't give up. 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 Woo! He didn't give up. I'm so glad that he didn't give up because we wouldn't have uh, Acts chapter 3 that's happening right now. We wouldn't see the redemptive nature of God uh, that even though I've been in the presence of God and, and I've been going to church all my life and, and I've been doing the things of God, I can still miss the Lord. Uh, but I want to let you know today is that he died on the cross for my sins uh, and my mess ups uh, so that in a day like today, uh, even when I've never noticed him before, uh, there's a Peter and John somewhere uh, that looks up upon me and says, I'll have mercy on you today. Uh, silver and gold have I not, uh, but such as I have, uh, I give unto thee. Sit down, sit down, sit down. It's important that you know this. That God hasn't given up on you. See, the Bible says he'll work all things out for your good. He'll, he'll make ways and pathways. He'll put people in your path. He'll connect people in the moments that you are. You thought you quit the fight. You thought you, you thought you just left out. You thought nobody cared. But God sent a text. God sent a post. God sent a, a, a forward. God sent a movement just to catch your attention. I don't know why it caught me this time. I don't know why I saw it this time. I never check my emails. I never look at my Instagram. I never call this person. Uh, but for some reason, uh, on this day, God intentionally allowed me to see it. Uh, and he said, I'm not through with you yet. An encounter with God is all you need. But there are things in your life that will prevent you from the encounter of God that you're supposed to have. And you have to be careful of identifying the distractions in your life. I'm here to say that some of you are distractions to your friends and your friends are distractions to you. You have a good time, but you're actually not living. Your life is full of events but not full of life. You're in a position in the place where you, you enjoy you in pockets. You, you like you on certain days, mainly Fridays. <laughs> After the work week is over. You like you once you clock out, you like you, a happy hour. You like you when things are going your way. But do you like you when you're going through the hardships of life and God is still working out his process in your life? Do you still like you? Because here's the thing, you only like you when there's a remedy involved. You only like you when you got a man.
You... You like you when you got somebody with you. Fellas, you like you when she's on your arm. You like you when you're going to Ruth Chris and getting a date. You like you when things are going in the way that you want. You like you when everybody's fawning around you. You like you when you get to do everything like the way you want it. You like you then, but you don't like you when God is trying to develop you and make you a brand new. You don't like you when it's uneasy and everybody doesn't do what you want them to do. You don't like you when you're doing the same thing that you've always been doing with the same people you been always doing it with you really don't like you so that's why you're an event liker you like yourself in events instead of liking yourself all the time and the reason is is because oftentimes we surround ourselves with days the bible said they took him to the gate daily my problem is is what kind of group of friends do you have around you that sees Jesus at the temple just like you do and they don't have the mindset to take you over to him you don't have a they that sees the potential in you you have a they that convinces you to go back into that tied relationship that's the only person that gives you an opportunity so you always go back you have a they that keeps you where you are and you need a they that will push you to the next level I'm here today to let you know don't get confined by a broken they I need some people that will look me in my eye and say you know you dead wrong get your tail up and get to where you need to be because you got a purpose to fulfill. Stop taking me back to the same relationships. Stop taking me back to the same sites. Stop taking me back to the same drugs. Stop taking me back to my old ways. Uh, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Stop being led astray. By things that do not have your best interests at heart. You're too easily swayed by people who don't care about where you're going. If the value in your life is that the people around there are there to offer you a good time, Yet every time you leave the good time, you feel worse. You got the wrong group of folk. If every time you get around them and their marriage, and the husband's talking about how much he hates his wife, so you can talk about how much you hate your wife, you're with the wrong they. You need some folk around you that are willing to challenge where you are, to, to challenge the state of where you're going to and look for accountability from your life. Stop hanging with stragglers that have no spiritual competency, no power of the Holy Spirit, can't cast out a demon if they saw one, have no authority in the spiritual realm, life and devotion is just as wasteful as anything, you need somebody with some power. See, we do a better resume check for the people we're dating than we do for the people that are supposed to hold us accountable. And you need some folk in your life that you need to know. Have you had an encounter with the living God? Because if you haven't had an encounter, you can't help me have an encounter with where we're going. <laughs> you can stay my friend, but we both need an encounter. The miracle of an encounter will transform your way of thinking. An encounter with God will have you stuck 
And yet in one moment, you will begin to see things you've never seen before. The Bible says he had been like this all his life. Some of us have been like this all our life. And what we have tried to do is we have tried to put our success as a means of filling the space where our identity was supposed to go. And so we buy and we create and we live and we join and we do so that we don't have to deal with us. And the Bible says, they took him there daily. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, says that even if you don't have some folk around you, there's some folk that are watching you. And the writer gives us a glimpse unto what's happening in the heavenlies and taking place earthly. He says, therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Somebody tell your neighbor, they're looking at us. Yes. <laughs> it says, let rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with the endurance, the race that is set before, somebody say me. There's a race set before you and if you don't have the right people in your life that can recognize the kind of race you're running, they will hinder you from obtaining the goal that God has for you. I don't need you to keep leading me to my old ways. Stop talking about how it used to be. How it used to be is not how it is today. Stop leading me down the path of remember when. I don't want to remember when. Remember when was when I had a hangover. Remember when was when I had a headache. Remember when was when I was in depression. Remember when was when my anxiety was going crazy. Remember when was when I couldn't complete a sentence without being on something. Remember when was when I couldn't shake it. But I remember now. I remember now when the Lord has changed my life. I remember now when the Lord has set me free. I remember now when the Lord touched my body and healed my mind. I remember now what he's doing. I'm not like I used to be. I'm not where I used to be. Don't take me back. I've had an encounter. If you're not careful of the phase in your life that will lead you astray. Can, can, I, can I just help you with this point real quick? Stop feeling sorry for your purpose. You do not have to keep giving people a reason for why you've moved on. owe you a reason why I don't call anymore. I don't owe you an example Be because if you were a real friend, you would be keeping up because we're in the same race going after the goal that has been set before us. Usually what happens is we fall apart because we start having different races to different goals. I'm headed towards the kingdom. Where are you headed? I'm headed towards the things that God has placed over my life. Where are you headed? I'm headed towards the purpose that God has set over my life. Where are you headed? Because by the looks of it, you're headed to your own demise. And you have to excuse me if I don't want to be included on you going where I don't want to go. 
I don't want to hear you talking about relationships every day, all day, as if you have no identity in God and your singleness is a curse from God. I don't want to hear you talking about how bad your marriage is and you do nothing about it and you stay and complain and you stay in the same place. I don't want to hear you talk about how much money you got every day and what you're doing with it and how far it's going. I don't mind pieces of it. It's just not my life. Be careful the people that keep taking you back to the old you. Some of us connect with them real easy. And the reason why you connect with them so easily is because they're so familiar. There's a spirit of familiarity where there's no growth. And the spirit of familiarity where there's no growth means you always lean back into the pocket of the things that keep you in the same place instead of being in a place where accountability and a sense of pain brings you to a place of growth and understanding that will put you in the new space that you are. Yes, people will talk about you. Yes, people will say things behind your back. Yes, people will leave out your life and let you know they left. But here's what I want to let you know. If you don't move on, you will stay at the gate called beautiful. You will stay at the place that looks good, but it's your place of brokenness. You will stay at the gate called beautiful, but it's not beautiful because it's not your purpose. You will stay at the place that has made itself look like it's a good place to be, but you were supposed to get up a long time ago. You were supposed to get up your bed uh, and get your legs moving. Get up off of where you are. Peter and John said, silver and gold, have I none? I don't want to talk to you about another house. I don't want to talk to you about another car. I don't want to talk to you about another thing but he said here's what I want to offer you get your tail up right now you should have been healed you should have been delivered you should have been walking in favor get up now <laughs> he says but such as I have I give unto thee tell somebody you can only give what you have if you ain't got no God in you, you can't give no God in you. If you ain't got no relationship in you, you can't give no relationship. If you ain't got no Holy Spirit in you, you can't give no Holy Spirit. All you can give is good advice. All you can give is your opinion. All you can give is your preference. But I need some people who have a well on the inside that is deep and overflowing that says, I'll tell you today, I'll speak it over your life. God is doing a new thing more than you can imagine or think. He is making ways out of no ways. Uh, he is setting paths uh, in the wilderness and giving white rivers in the desert. I've got something more to offer you than good advice. I can offer you the word of God. Write this down. Stop asking people for what they don't have. Stop asking people for what they don't have. For those of you that are in relationships or married or you're trying to figure out why isn't the way, my question is, did you ask the questions? For those of you that are single, before you get in it, you need to what? Ask the questions. Because you're trying to get out of people what was never there. And then you are frustrated with what you don't see. I want you to write this down. An encounter with God opens up new possibilities. And people who are complacent don't like new. You ever talk to somebody about something new and they start getting agitated immediately? You know, I was thinking, why would you go there? You know, I was considering, why would you want to be that? You know, I was thinking through, why would that be on your mind? Immediately, I want to let you know that in God encounter will put you at odds with people who are used to you being like you've always been. Familiar people get angry when you have a God encounter that moves you from where you used to be to where God has called for you to be. And then they will play the blame game that it's your fault that you didn't move. 
Uh, you know what? Let, you know, it's, it's not my problem. That's your problem. You know what? They make you feel guilty about your God encounter. And I want to tell you today, if you've got people that are surrounding you, if you've got situations that are surrounding you, it will keep you from new possibilities. It is the person that is always weighing out every option to see how much it benefits them, to see how much it's going to put pain in their life that never reaches the calling that God has over their life. They go all the way to the edge, but just before the edge is needed. And I want to say to somebody today, a God, an encounter with God opens up new possibilities. Some of the things that you're depressed about are the things in your life because you haven't had an encounter with God that's put you into a new perspective that God has something on the other side of it that you cannot see. There's a hope that comes with a God encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit that says it doesn't always look like this. It doesn't always go that way. I know you're a Christian, but my answer and my, my, my question to you is have you had a God encounter? When's the last time you and God spent some time together? When's the last time you heard the voice of the Lord speak to you? When's the last time you sat quietly and said, I'll wait on the Lord and I'll be of good carriage. And I know even in the midst of me waiting, the Lord will strengthen my heart. When's the last time you felt the presence of the Lord move right where you are? When's the last time that you felt so frustrated with life and frustrated with where you are, right where you are? I don't care if it was in the middle of your cubicle. You just begin to seek the Lord and say, God, I need you right now. If you don't show up, I don't know what I'm going to do in the next moment. How many of us are willing to have a God encounter no matter what and stop taking advice? Listen, everybody doesn't know everything. And instead of doing the work, we love seeking people before we seek God. I want to share with you today, so not God's not calling for your life. <sighs> what new possibilities have you passed up because you weren't willing to have an encounter with God? And number three, an encounter with God ensures you will never be the same. It's when people look at you and they know you're not the same person. It's when people identify you've changed. You say, yep. I'm not the same person I was five years ago. When people look at you, they know there's a development that's taking place that's like not before. I, I, I want to tell somebody in here, you may be going through a hard place and a hard moment in life, but it's because God is trying to force your movement. It is because God is trying to force the next stage of where you're going. You wouldn't seek him. So God says, I love you so much, I'll make you move. <laughs> you don't want to seek me? I bet you this will make you seek me. Some of you don't even understand where you are right now is just a situation uh, for you to delve deeper into the things of God. God is saying, I'll be here when you stop complaining and you start praying. I'll be right here when you make a move to move from where you are and seek after me. I'll be right here and have you wait on me because the next stage of where you're going can't go the way you already are. I know you think you've ever arrived and you are where you need to be, but sometimes God puts us in a place so that we're never the same. He wants you to be in the moment so you don't go backwards to where you used to be. Some of us, God is calling us out and we're calling ourselves to settle. And the Lord is saying, I gave you something new, but you don't even recognize the new is for me and not for you. You got so self-indulged into how this was going to bless you and how it was going to bless your family and how you were going to be able to do this. God said, you never consider me. So here's the thing. I'll bless you with it and then I'll make you try to figure out why you can't enjoy it. I'll bless you with it and then make you sit in the middle of it and try to figure out why hell is breaking loose over your life. I'll sit you right in it until you open your eyes uh, and surrender yourself and say, God, whatever it is you want me to hear, I'll listen today. Open my ears that I may hear. Open my eyes that I might see. God's trying to get your attention. Some of what the Lord is doing is so that you never go back to the old place and old thinking you came from. But some of us are casually seeking the Lord because we find out that life is falling where we want. 
I got the person beside me I want. I've got the house I've got. I, I, I've got the kids I've got. I've got the situation I've got. And I want to tell some of us that are in here, you're in the right place at the right time. You're on the edge of about to lose it, but that's right where you need to be in order for God to start to shift some things in your life. If you weren't on the edge of it, if your children weren't about to lose their mind, you might not have sent the Lord like you were supposed to. You might not have been in the position to do it, but the Lord has messed up all your perfect plans uh, and he's put you in the position uh, where you get on your knees and he told them uh, he said I want you to wait in Jerusalem for me to come some of you just need to wait on the Lord and be of good caring he said wait on the Holy Spirit that is coming some of us need a shift uh, some of us need a move in direction some of us need something to change uh, and God says your job ain't doing it your money's not doing it the relationship won't do it your children won't do it I'm just trying to tell somebody today get ready for a shift tell your neighbor it's shifting time I want to speak it over your life today. God's trying to wake you up right where you are. You've been asleep for too long. And God says, wake up. I can't do a miracle in a stale mind. There's a shift taking place. You want to shift and be comfortable. Go back and open your Bible and read it again. Nothing happens in comfort. Nothing. Pastor, can you show me how to fix this? No. Go through it. Go through it. You quit church 10 times already. Go through it. You know, Bishop, I, Pastor, you know, I, I'm just going to have to take off right now, you know, from the minute. It's just, it's too weighty. The Lord said it was supposed to be weighty. See, the issue is you think getting out of it lessens the weight. And the Lord is saying, no, it's the pressure that produces. You need the pressure to produce. Some of us haven't produced in a long time. And so there's a pressure that God is putting on you in this moment that will drop you back to your original day where you used to be on your knees before the living God. Shut your door. Get yourself a babysitter. Put yourself in a hotel room and say, for the next two days, I'll seek him till I find him. He said, if you'll seek me, you'll find me. Knock in the door, Shelby, what? Open. I dare you go knock until he opens. My question is, are you desperate enough for an encounter with Jesus?